Pleasure. Uh, Brad Jersak in the house again on the Daniel Strickland podcast. This is season mind blown. And we're looking at scriptures or concepts or theological truths that we thought we knew that we are refreshingly happy, glad to know we were wrong about. And, uh, and that we've been invited into realizing that it's better than we ever thought. Uh, and God is more than we could ever even imagine. So we're excited to have you, Brad. You're one of the people that have been blown our minds. Uh, for me for a long, long time. So, and you keep at it. So well done. And I love one of my favorite things, actually uh, discovering Jesus and the life that he called me to is that um, the born again nature of my conversion never, ever ends. It seems to me like that's the mind blown invitation is like, this keeps happening. I keep getting born again and again and again and again, and it's better, more different, greater, uh, than I could have ever hoped for. So Likewise. That, yeah, it's cool. So I love watching you do that. And I love watching you discover it. I mean, you, you have the joy of, uh, I guess, or the, the calling to write it down so that we can listen in on some of the ways that you've been, you've been discovering things. Our last conversation, we didn't get to this, but when we had first invited you to come, we wanted to talk a little bit about the cross, about Jesus and the work that was done. And then uh, hell. <laughs> And yep. then we quickly discovered that talking about uh, the cross and hell in one hour is uh, virtually impossible. It's just too much to say. Uh, so we really want to talk about hell. What the hell, Brad? We need to talk about hell better. I think uh, <laughs> that's been part of the issue, right? Is that people had a very narrow idea and vivid image of what they thought hell is. And because it was often so medieval and literalizing imagery from scripture that was not meant to be literalized or totalized, then you have this overreaction. And so people in their abhorrence of the monster God who burns his children forever, um, they end up overreacting and and just saying, well, there's no such thing as hell. It's like, what have you not watched news <laughs> the news have have you not been there do you and then already you see that i'm it sounds like i'm using hell as a metaphor for life i would say um that's exactly right is that hell is a metaphor <laughs> for life and for alienation and for uh, but also a metaphor for divine judgment, whatever that means, and however that will that will roll out. But we've just, um, it seems to me, there is a lot in scripture about, about hell or Hades or divine judgment and so on um, that is not easily harmonized. So we like picked the worst version and then <laughs> like redlined it and made that the only thing. And it's just um, not even actually- accurate. I wonder if we picked the worst version or we picked the most popularized, like the Dante Inferno, you know, yep. seven layers of hell. So we, we just picked the easiest thing to visualize and popularize in the medieval period. And we were like, oh, yeah, that's how I because I think in my life, I would have not really thought much about this at all. I just would have assumed, oh, yeah, hell, that's a drag. Like, you don't want to go there. Um, that's, that's good advice. That's just, and even like I'm positive, true regardless of what you think hell is, this is good advice. It's like don't you don't want to live there, you don't want to go there. And I would say like in in the I come from a Salvation Army tradition. I remember there's a famous Salvation Army found like one of the founders who said the only way you'll ever go to hell is over the broken, mangled body of Jesus. Wow. It was also one of my favorite quotes ever. Because <laughs> it would be like like this person has made it virtually almost impossible. Like if you're going to go there, it's going to be over. Uh, but even that, I think, is not quite. I mean, they're going to the edges of where I think we want to go. Yeah, they're not yeah. quite there yet, right? Which is fair enough. They were pretty advanced for uh, 1865, but um, anyway. Yeah, in one one of the ancients said it this way, and they do, he really did double down on it. And I've lost his name at the moment, but was you can be assured that if anyone, if anyone is in hell, Christ is there with them. Um, you can go as deep into the abyss as you could ever imagine, and and you will never not discover that Christ has been there ahead of you and is there under you and willing to lead you up and out. And that is how a lot of the patristic tradition and even, I dare say, the Bible presents it. Yeah, I mean, I mean there are literally verses that say that you can make your bed 
in the depths of Sheol and there you can't escape the love of God, right? Like that's exactly right. Yeah. I was raised, so I remember speaking at this youth conference. This is kind of probably when this started popping up. I was speaking at this youth conference, like in Winnipeg or something, and the conference was called Unstoppable. And I had this really fancy message. I thought I was pretty proud of myself because teenagers, you know, they like to have some control and make some choices. So I thought, oh, this is perfect. My Wesleyan background will serve me well here. I thought the only thing that can stop the love of God is you. That was my my message is like, you hold this power to say yes or no, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I'm walking, literally walking up, they do this big announcement, I'm walking up to deliver this message, and God speaks to me and says, it's a nice message. I said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like God said to me, it's it's just not true. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. And I remember like walking up the steps of this going like, oh no, like the bottom's falling out of like my main. Like, you my, didn't want to mention this sooner maybe? <laughs> he's like, it's just not true. Like, who do you think you are? Like, and I right? think there's that, like I, I, there's something about that kind of, uh, that it changed something. It like opened something to me. Like, do I really think that I, I can stop the love of God, <laughs> like even in my own life, like even when I view my own history, like if I could have stopped the love of God, I would have, <laughs> yes, but yes. it turns out I couldn't. And I wonder if that's not the same, that premise. So it's less about, oh, I'm poking holes in theology and just more about, oh, wow, there's so much I don't understand. And even in this subject, so much I haven't even bothered to explore so much assumptions that I've made. Uh, and things that I just, even though they're not congruent uh, with what I know about God. Sure. You you know, and you're in good company. Uh, C.S. Lewis said that hell is locked from the inside. In other words, he was trying to make the same play. Yeah. And, uh, but. <laughs> That's rebels words, to the end, right? Where he goes, right. the, hell is uh, populated with rebels to the end. Like, yeah. Right? And, and, and. It's a nice story. In fact, The Great Divorce is my favorite novel by him. Uh, but Revelation chapter 1 says that it's Christ who holds the keys of death in Hades. So I like to ask this. If Jesus Christ holds the keys of death in Hades, what do you think he'll do with them? And uh, what he has done with them is he, he, opened, he has opened the doors and, and well... Sometimes it seems he's opened the doors. At other times, the language is he's shattered the gates of Hades. And they lie as rubble under his feet. The, the locks and hinges and, and chains that held death shut have been broken apart. And uh, he's not only entered there, but he bound, in Christ's own words, he bound the strong man entered his house and has plundered his goods, which is you and me. And right. so you, you see that Christ gets the last word. And while I understand the sentiment of um, wanting to honor the principle of free will, um, we would only lock the door and resist forever if we believed a lie forever. But the truth will set us free, and he who he sets free will be free indeed. So I think of it as a, a freed will response to the love of God when we see Christ face to face. And all of the seductions and delusions of the world and the ego and the demonic, whatever, um, when those are removed and our will is restored to what it was created to be and we see Christ face to face, we'll do exactly not only what Paul did on the road to Damascus, but what he says we'll all do in Philippians 2, that those who are in heaven and in the earth and under the earth will bow and confess with joy that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there is a, we've had this last word idea about hell. And uh, I remember Brian McLaren wrote a great book about it, The Last Word and The Word After That. <laughs> the word after right. that is his mercy endures forever. Right. And his loving kindness is everlasting and mercy triumphs over judgment. I think uh, some of the places you've said that it's, it's interesting, isn't it? How we kind of the only person that can stop God loving you is you. And we kind of we meditate on that and we chew on that. 
Uh, so apparently we can stop God's love, but we were unable to stop God's punishment at the end of the day. We're unable to stop this judgment. Like, why is it that we think that um, God's wrath or judgment or or even God's lack of mercy is somehow stronger than God's mercy? It seems so curious to me. Um, and Brad, your, the piece you were sharing there um, has been really helpful for me. Uh, e- even as a past, you know, people have said, you know, I have, I have family members who who don't know who Jesus is, and, and that's really hard, and, uh, and I'm fearful for them. You know what I mean? Like, this is something that, this is real stuff every day that, that frightens people. And, uh, and what you shared before, that like, well, they're, they're rejecting probably the same Jesus that I reject. They're rejecting a Jesus that lusts for power. They're rejecting a Jesus that denigrates women. They're rejecting a Jesus that uh, promotes racism. They're, they're rejecting the Jesus that I reject. But when they have this opportunity and when they uh, see Jesus in his uncorrupted splendor and glory uh, and beauty, and they say just love beyond love beyond love, then, then how can you not fall at the knees? The, the only people that resist that are those that are so broken that they can't receive that love and God heals. So I don't, there's no space for it. <laughs> right. You're also, I think, Brad, you're also, just to be clear, you're not saying there isn't a hell. Oh, no, absolutely not. In fact, um, um, there's, there's layer, there are layers in terms of my understanding of it. And because we have various imagery for it in the Bible, um, I guess I, I need to to make some choices about which versions or imagery to choose from. So, for example, you're, you're, you're going to have some that is like um, hell is separation from God. Uh, two groups of people go to two destinations. The believers go to heaven. The unbelievers go to hell. Well, that's one way to see it. Another way to see it is we all come before God, this is from scripture as well, that hell, heaven and hell are our orientations to divine love. If you hate love, you cannot escape from the fire of the love of God and it will be hellish. It also will be transformative. <laughs> and, um, and if you love the love of God, then you'll experience as it, it is eternal life. So these are existential descriptions of two orientations to the one fire which is divine love. So that, um, but, but even then, I think, um, I think a better way to talk about it than thinking in terms of afterlife judgment, and I do believe in afterlife judgment, I do believe that we'll all pass through the fire. I just happen to believe that the fire is God, that the fire is love, and that the fire is restorative. It's the refiner's fire of Malachi 3. It's the, refi- it's the launderer's soap is another image for it. It's about cleansing. It's about renewal. It's about the restoration of all things. But that's still getting ahead of ourselves using this world imagery for a mystery in terms of the afterlife. That's not how the Jesus of John's gospel thinks about it. The Jesus of John's gospel, and and now we're dealing with a much more mature theology. John the Apostles had an additional generation to converse with the Lord about these things. And that comes out in his gospel and in 1 John. Um, And and the way he presents the Jesus of John chapter 3 is is that whatever, whatever, uh, he doesn't call it hell, he calls it perishing. And he doesn't call it heaven, he calls it eternal life. And whatever perishing and eternal life are, that's now. And so when I say we need to talk about hell better, then perhaps we should think about the way Jesus presents it there. That um, I've been in hell, it's called the Lower East Side of Vancouver. I've been in hell, it's in the it's in the refugee camps of Burma, in the little homes where amputees who've had their faces and legs blown off by bombs live in third generation refugee status. That's not a metaphor, that's actual hell. Hell is a metaphor for that, right? And so Christ comes along in John 3 and he says, look at I am not threatening to condemn you. You are already perishing. Right. I've come to rescue you from 
the hellish condition of alienation in your human condition now, you know, and, and I've come not to offer you heaven someday if you say the right, right prayer. I'm offering you eternal life now through knowing me and meeting me. So what that does, instead of me worrying about all my loved ones, where they might go when they die, I'm worried about them today and what they're experiencing and what hell looks like for them and how I might bring the presence of Jesus into real existence in this time so that the point is not rewards or punishment later. The point is knowing him and being freed by him today. Yeah, that's I, powerful. I, I do want to mention there is a Muslim, there is a Muslim mystic who really got this right. She used to wander around, was it Basran or um, one of the cities in Iraq with a torch and a jar full of water. And they would ask her, why are you doing this? And she said, with, with this water, I will quench the flames of hell. With this torch, I will burn down the gates of heaven so that your faith will, so that you will love God for God's sake, not for reward or punishment. And I'm like, sign me up for that. You wow. Know? Wow. I think that's, I, I mean, I think that's powerful because you're taking it out of this, like, and I, I, this is so, uh, well, it's just so normal, right? Like uh, for us to be thinking about heaven and hell in light of like a place later after we die. Yeah. Instead of, which is weird because I feel like we've come a long way uh, in the church thinking about kingdom yep. and God's kingdom coming. And, and so I feel like we were, we've been through this whole revelation, it feels like me, where we're like, oh, this like the spiritual realm is like coming and invading this place called earth. Like this is a, so it would only make sense then that the spiritual realm, right? Like that includes uh, both uh, the kingdom, you know, yep. of God, and then also the, the realities of spiritual darkness. And um, for those of us who have seen a lot of, dark things there's no denying like i can't you know i'm the last person who's going to deny evil um right, right. i've seen it you know i've seen there's no other way to describe what i've seen except evil and yeah. total you know absence of of love and light i remember uh it's romeo dallaire who wrote shaking hands with the devil catholic guy that led the un forces in rwanda and kind of just and had a total mental breakdown canadian french canadian yeah. And he wrote in the in the foreword of the book, he said, you know, I came down totally had a mental breakdown and all my friends kind of rediscovered God. And all my friends were like, how can you believe in a God? You know, after all that evil. And he said, how can you not believe in God when you've shaken hands with the devil? Wow. And that's that's the the premise of the of his faith rediscovery is that like this darkness is so real. There must be uh a corresponding there must be somebody has to rescue us from this this darkness yeah you know what you you've done something very new testamenty there as well um because what we had we testaments that's what you hand out at like funerals right for your breath and stuff but no, no, that's bad that's a dad joke <laughs> you, you gotta to call that one breath you've got to <laughs> cut that you've got to cut that speaking no. of hell let's talk yeah. about humor for a second no, that was that was really in that was the unforgivable sin right there. That was um, yeah. so no my point is this though that when people use the word hell in that medieval sense they often only think of the one chapter in the whole bible that talks about the lake of fire in revelation 20 and right. that that is where you go after the final judgment if your name wasn't written in the lamb's book of life and so on they still need to read the next two chapters of course where it describes the gates of heaven being opened, those outside the gates coming in, all of that. But my point is this, you're describing hell as something different than an, than an afterlife punishment. You're describing it as a kingdom that you've run into. Mm -hmm. And so does the New Testament. So Colossians 1 calls that the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. But in James' epistle, he comes right out and calls it hell. Hell for James is a kingdom. The flames of hell are what ignite the fires of the, the fiery tongue that accuses and slanders the other. In right. other words, where do you find the fires of hell? In you. And, and where there's smoke, there's fire, you know? So when, when somebody is, is speaking forth like words of death and condemnation, um, 
their tongue is being ignited by that kingdom from James's point of view. So he's not thinking place. He's not thinking punishment. He's even, he's thinking about us as a kingdom or a source of evil that we can participate in. Mm -hmm. And, and which you can see in the Rwanda story that the, the dominant participants in the kingdom of hell were actually professing Christians. You know, that's a well, the nation, (laughs) what is it? 92% of Rwandians were in church Sunday before the the genocide. So it it was the nation, you know, Christian nation, the idea. I was talking to pastors the other day, just saying, like, if you think getting people to church is going to save your nation, you haven't been paying attention. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Got to be more than that. Yeah. Wow. Mm. By how many people at the uh, insurrection in Washington right. were, were churchgoers and, and probably quite proud churchgoers as well, right? <laughs> this is saying there's uh, yeah. going to the church thing. <laughs> yeah. um, the, why, we, why we hooked the, the cross and hell together, of course, is because I think how we view God, uh, and especially through Jesus, um, is how we view hell. Like, I, those things are so deeply connected. You can see they're just like a... They're like dominoes that are all set up. And when you take out this idea that God is not angry with us, with humanity, that God is not uh, wrathful, he's not having a place to pour out his wrath, he's not separated from us because of anything that we could do, yeah. uh, then hell makes no sense. You know, the, at least the traditional way we viewed hell makes no sense anymore because how could that God, you know? And uh, the other thing I used to think even as a, uh, as a younger person was like, well, either salvation is a gift like eternal life is a gift or it's not right but like you can't have if eternal life's a gift how do you send someone to hell forever they don't have the gift like how can they live forever if they're not receiving yeah. the, so that was the thing i never i was like i don't get it it's a gift or it's not a gift or we're all eternal beings after all i mean what's going on you're forgiven or you're not forgiven right and so what does romans 5 say but that while we were still sinners while we were yet enemies yeah. Not only did Christ die for us and forgive us, Paul even says he reconciled us to himself. And so God was in Christ reconciling us to himself, not counting our sins against us. Well, does he or doesn't he? I think you've exactly hit it. There's that. So in terms of um, uh, if the truth is that God is, is good and this self-giving lover who's actually forgiven us, um, then then it calls into question at least the eternal retributive nature of hell. The other thing connected to that and the cross is if in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he conquered death and he holds the keys of death in Hades. And now Romans 8 says, death cannot separate us from the love of God. What's this thing we've done with a ticking time bomb in terms of you have to decide in this life and if you don't it's too late so imagine that three well i I was going to say three minutes let's use an actual case my grandpa my grandpa william ditchfield (laughs) spent um you know over 80 years resisting and consciously rejecting christ and the gospel one hour before he passed away of lung cancer uh, my dad prayed with him and the best my grandfather could do. He, it was like he was writhing. My dad prayed a prayer for him. My grandpa nodded because he couldn't speak anymore and then went into a deep state of peace for the next hour. Wow. In our theology, we would say, well, then when he died, he meets the Lord. The question is, Did he receive Jesus Christ as his savior? Yes. Even one hour before, is that good enough? It was for the thief on the cross. However, what if he hadn't? Can you imagine one after one hour after his death? If Christ had said, did you receive me as Lord? No. Oh, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for you then. That makes death the winner. And if nothing else, the new Testament declares that Christ is the winner, death is defeated, and it can't separate you from love. Now, I still think my grandfather will pass through a final judgment, a fiery one, 
a great and terrible day that requires him to look at the meaning of his life, the years that he wasted not knowing Christ, not embracing the eternal life that was his. And I ex expect that that includes weeping and wailing and even gnashing of teeth. And then <laughs> Christ will wipe every tear from his eyes. Mm -hmm. And so this, this, I think there's been a concern that if we say Christ actually is the conqueror of death and hell, yeah. then people won't give their lives to Christ in this life. And so what we need is, is a sufficient threat to make them do it. Right. What if, what if it really does matter that they know him now, but not because they might burn forever someday, but because this is the only life they get to live and offer him and how tragic it would be not to experience his grace and, and know how much he loves them and, 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 be free of fear and shame and condemnation. Now, uh, to me, that's incredibly urgent. And, and so I am, I am a much more, I would say I'm more free as an evangelist now than I was when I had a dirty little secret I needed to worry about. I didn't want people to know about. Wow. That's great. I mean, I think that's because I think what you're doing is you're touching on people's fear like, why are people so afraid when it comes to hell? Um, and like you say, I mean, you have a great book, by the way. If people want to dig into this further, uh, the book is Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, Hope, Hell, and the New Jerusalem by Bradley Lee Jersak. So I've been reading. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, good and also deep, as usual. So uh, get ready to take your notes, everybody. But uh, if you're looking for more, and then you also just recently released a book, a novel, a little novel called The Pastor. Yes. which I listened to in my car the other day. I told James I did a couple extra round around the block passes to finish, uh, to finish it. Uh, but a great just storytelling, a narrative of, I feel like what you've been suggesting here, like the fire, the refiner's fire of like yeah. the hell that we go through because of our own lies and fear and repressed pain and this liberating presence through a person, you know, so it's, it's a great, that's also, I highly recommend it. It's a great read. It's a great listen. Cause it's, um, it's dramatized, huh? The reading oh is fantastic. Yeah. We really recommend the audiobook because you get the, the, this fullness of these, uh, it's a full cast of professional actors. Um, yeah, it was really, except for really one, good. Uh, the one who's not a professional was my son, Dominic, who played the part of Jackie. Okay. Great. But, um, yeah, and the, the subtitle of the book is A Crisis, which comes from the Greek word krisis, which which is the word we translate judgment or condemnation quite often. Mm. But what Christ has called us to, this is the end of Mark 9, he says, it's, you know, it's it's better to cut your hand off or poke your eye out and go into the kingdom of heaven with one hand and one eye than into the fires of Gehenna or hell with two. But the very next word he says is, for you will all pass through the fire. You will, no, he says, you will all be salted with fire. Mm. And then he says, but salt is good. So make sure you have salt in yourself. What? So he's just <laughs> taken their medieval views of, it's pre-medieval even, right? He's taken their, the views of hell that they picked up from the Enoch tradition and so on between the Testaments. And so they have an idea of I'm, I'm in because I'm good. The wicked are out because they're bad. I go to the kingdom of heaven or paradise. They go to the kingdom of Gehenna because... And, and and so that's how it works. So he Jesus picks up on that, and then he flips the tables on them, and he's basically saying, "A, you all get salted with fire. It's not two groups of people. Right. B, the salting of fire is good. So it's not simply retributive. It's somehow restorative. Yeah. Three, make sure that means you can do it yourself." Step into the fire of cleansing judgment mm. and do it on purpose. And where is it? In you. Right. And so he's internalized it. He's personalized it. He's universalized it. And he's redeemed it into something restorative. So I just, I think that's, that's like what's a going step on four, with, right? Yeah. Step four. Go ahead and do it, guys, right? All yeah. the things you've ever done, face your worst fear, reveal to the light all the darkness that's in you. Yeah. And uh, that's and what's happening a, a, in the pastor book. That yeah. he, he's passing through that fire, he has to face oh. in, in some way. My son Dominic put it this way it's like, wow, this is this is like a really effed up version of of uh 
a Christmas Carol, <laughs> uh, complete with visitors, and yes. God bless us, everyone. In the end, you know, yes, like, <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Uh, can you walk me through the sheep and the goats? Sure. So, <laughs> wow, we just got <laughs> straight on it. Eh? <laughs> um, what Danielle for for listeners, Danielle's referring to the judgment of Matthew twenty five, where Christ says that that in the end there will be there will be a judgment of sheep and goats where the son of man comes with glory and he'll gather all the nations before him and then he will divide them between sheep and goats and um and and the sheep will enter eternal life and the goats will enter eternal punishment bad mistranslation so how can i nail this really quickly well first of all do you take this judgment literally? If so, good. You're not. You're in. You're. You're. You've got no problem, because it's not people. It's sheep and goats. So it's just a farm animal judgment. You're fine. Oh wait, no. Probably, probably it's not sheep and goats. Probably it's the righteous and the wicked. Okay. Now let's talk about um, what is the criteria for entering the kingdom of heaven or being sent off into eternal hell. What's an evangelical tell you? You say the sinner's prayer, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that that's not the criteria in Matthew 25? The criteria in Matthew 25 is entirely sins of, om sins of omission. Mm -hmm. There's not even like rapists and murderers and stuff like that. It's right. just like if you didn't take care of the marginalized, you will go to hell forever. <laughs> that's So he's already thrown off our criteria quite badly if you care for if you care for the poor and the sick and the naked and the prisoner and the refugee um you're a sheep if you don't care for them you're a goat so okay that's interesting so now he's using the final judgment as a as, as a kind of venue to talk about christian ethics what is what is our ethic the next surprise in it there's a lot of surprises the next surprise in it is is the surprise. So you've got people who would have never confessed faith in Jesus Christ, utterly surprised that they're getting in just because like they helped a sick guy. <laughs> and you've got people who are, who've had ministries elsewhere we see in the gospels, ministries of deliverance, healing, preaching, all of that. And they're getting surprised because they're being sent into outer darkness. Why? Well, because, because they turned away refugees at the border put their kids in cages. You're going to hell for that. I'm telling you, you know, so, <laughs> okay. And then, and then the, the next surprise is, well, hang on a second. It's not actually heaven or hell. It's, um, he uses this word. It's, we've mistranslated it. Um, eternal punishment. It's, it's colossus, which isn't punishment. It's the term is it's corrective judgment. There is a term for, for retributive judgment. That's timoria. He doesn't use that. He could have used that, but instead he uses the one that's used for correction. And then also, Ionios is not eternal. Ionios refers to an age or the age to come or the threshold of the age to come. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory to judge, to render judgment, he gathers all nations before him. And then, and then um, he says the outcome will be either a welcome into the kingdom of God or being sent into a, an age of correction. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a truth and reconciliation commission. And in this truth and reconciliation commission, yeah, y y you don't want to show up there and find out you've been guilty all your lives of neglecting Christ himself in those you meet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it is meant to be a dire warning uh, but, but then there's one more stage in this. It's very early on in the, in the church by the second century, I think, um, people started realizing that the sheep and goats aren't two sets of people because on any given day, I do help the poor or I don't, I feed the hungry or I don't, I skip the hospital visit or I go to it. I could be a sheep or a goat on any given day. So which is it? Is he just going to weigh them all? Mm -hmm. Or is the fact that the word of the Lord is a sharp, 
two-edged sword that slices between the wheat and tares, the sheep and the goat, and righteousness and wickedness in me. And there's the fire again. So, so I, I just think those who want to get like overly certain that this is talking about a, a heaven and hell final judgment aren't reading the parable. Hey, there's another one. It's a parable. <laughs> They're not reading the parable very carefully and letting the problems present themselves. And I think what's going on there is like, it's so problematic. It doesn't match our theology because it's not about the nature of heaven and hell or right. even the final judgment. What is it? It's a, it's an urgent call to live in a particular way today. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's an ethical statement framed in the final judgment rather than the final judgment offering you a criteria for how you're going to make it into the right to the good place right so ah the good place that is <laughs> that's a fun little uh if you haven't watched it on netflix yet it's a fun little ethical dilemma using heaven and hell or yep. hell disguised as heaven and i mean it's very confusing but hey let's do that <laughs> <laughs> It's it's interesting. The uh, yeah, we kind of people default to the Matthew twenty five piece. Of, well, there you know, there's the judgment and there's the hell. And I, and I think you uh, did an excellent and very brief, impressively brief explanation there. But you know, the, the other place we see Jesus talk about this kind of conscious fiery torment is again in Luke with <laughs> with the rich man and Lazarus. And again, nothing to do with what they confessed. Everything to do with uh, how the rich man treated Lazarus. And indeed, I mean, ironically, yeah, Lazarus just laid there being sick and that apparently that was enough right like even just just being the least was enough to be drawn into well abraham's bosom and you might need to explain that i'm not entirely sure what we mean by that <laughs> yeah i think that's a fantastic question because what people have done is they've said i can tell you the nature of hell it doesn't talk about hell it talks about hades but i can teach i can tell you the nature of hades from this parable parable <laughs> yeah. um and it generally not only missing the point of the parable, but also the punchline. So just to give you, there's three layers to it. There's Jesus speaking to his immediate audience that we are told are like Pharisees who love money. <laughs> that's the point. A little bit of context there. Right? I don't know if that's right? helpful. But. So that's the first layer. And what he's what he is warning them of is that when it comes to economic um, uh, inequity, there will be a great reversal. Mm. And you see it already in Luke in the Magnificat when Mary is singing about the, the powerful being pulled down from their thrones and the poor and the needy being lifted up. And it's not just a round table where we're all equal again. It's no, like it's an actual reversal. And, and so that's, that's, he's warning them about that. And I think on that, in that case, the question is not, um, are you the, are you the rich man or Lazarus? The, what he's saying is you are the rich man, period. So who's the poor man at your gate and what are you going to do about it in light of the coming inversion? There's a second context that not just Jesus speaking to his immediate audience of Pharisees, but it's Luke writing the book to a Christian community and he's repurposing, I think, um, Jesus' words to a new inclusion exclusion dilemma of Jews and Gentiles. And there's a lot of evidence right within the parable Lazarus is the Greek name for the Jewish name Eleazar, who was the servant of Abraham, who lost his entire inheritance as a Gentile when Abraham had an heir. Okay, so here we go. We've got Lazarus, wow. oh, who man. represents <laughs> the Gentiles, and we've got the rich man, who, by the way, has five brothers, like Judah did, representing the Jews. And he's like, look at to my Jewish listeners, beware of... Beware of excluding the Gentiles because there's going to be a great inversion. And so let's be inclusive and recognize, because remember, he's on Paul's team that's always dealing with Judaizers who want to exclude the Gentiles. Now, Luke is saying in the very words of Jesus are addressing this problem, and he gives you hints. So that's the second layer, but it's the third layer I'm most interested in, and that's the punchline. 
um, you've got this, this idea that there's a chasm no one can cross, that there is an abyss no one can come back from. Is that true? <laughs> the, the punchline is the cross and Christ's descent into hell and his resurrection. He has crossed the chasm no one can cross. He has entered the abyss that no one can come back from. And Ephesians says, when he came back, he, he led captives in his wake. In other words, he goes in, he doesn't rise from an empty tomb alone. He rises from Hades with a parade of people coming out who've been freed from there. So then, so, so Pope Benedict the 16th said, the punchline of all of these parables is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I, wa I want to issue kind of a scathing rebuke. If I could do it kindly, I'll try. We have no business in that parable without reference to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have no business describing Hades at all without re hit reference to Jesus entering it, conquering it, and coming back. And to those who do, I would say, do you not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And the power of that resurrection to shatter those gates, empty the place, and restore um, those who'd been bound up there. That's the theology of the New Testament, mm. and it's the theology of the church. Mm. Um, and so, so th this pretending Jesus' passion has no impact on the nature of that parable is is incredibly uh, shallow exegesis and i think people need to read their bibles more and read their bibles through that lens i think that might be also helpful yeah but rather was, than isolated incidents that we make right. into our theology yeah yeah and that are trying to prove what you yeah. already think i think that's the mind blown strategy is like what if we let go of what it was that we're hanging on to so t t tightly and yeah. just let the let jesus let the spirit let the scriptures speak to us uh, it might just be one of the best, most refreshing things we've ever done <laughs> and yeah. liberating practices. And the good news might get even better than we thought. Um, we don't have to be afraid anymore. And it helps you realize how many of these, you know, our mind blown moments that we've had quite a few of. Um, so much of them are kind of uh, patchwork, even Frankenstein theologies. Okay, so we've ripped this one line out of Matthew 25, and we piece that together with a little bit of Jesus talking about Lazarus, and then we Frankenstein that with uh, yeah, the end of Revelation, not the very end. We can't. We have to. We actually have to ignore the very end of Revelation. That's a problem. Uh, yeah. But you know the the fire. And if we put all those things together, and again, I, I, I don't know I've seen this put up on tracks and handed them out, and and we see it. Uh, and, and instead of embracing this whole story and, and looking, as you say, through this, uh, the cruciform narrative and the, and the death and life and death and resurrection of Jesus and how that speaks to every one of them and, and changes every one of them infinitely forever. It has to, right? Yeah. So I know a guy and at the bottom of his email, his signature, at the very bottom, it says this, it's Jesus or hell. Wow. Hey. Eh? Now, <laughs> he's sure sure well actually as i'm talking yeah. to you about hell i'm thinking he's right he's right now like, what he means that, by hell who knows right but <laughs> well or it's the problem is what other people think yeah of hell. that's the real problem but actually i'm at, i'm now convinced i've been trying to get him to to to, to remove that because i think it's telling people the wrong thing but at the same time now i'm like I think it's more true than it's ever been true before because <laughs> I'm like hell being this place inside of us, like this darkness, like all those places where our fears are embedded, where we can't be our true selves, where we're like the worst of ourselves, where we're ashamed of ourselves, where we're stuck in cycles of sin and death, you know, like, ah, I'm like, yeah, it's Jesus or hell. In that way, I'm like, oh, I think he's right. I just think the way that people, when you say the word hell, of course, what they think is Dante's Inferno, they think fiery pit, they think, you know, angry God. And it motivates them to flee from him. Right. Um, what if we stopped using the word, what if hell, like hell isn't a New Testament word anyway, you know, it was, a, it was a translation. Yeah. And from German, Norwegian, whatever, you know, whatever mythological backstory was being borrowed to translate it. Yeah. Well, we can retranslate it ourselves into English and into ways that don't drive people from Christ, but draw them to him. So when I say 
Hell is alienation. Tell me about your hell. There, people are like, oh, I can tell you exactly about my hell. And they don't feel defensive. And I'm like, this is, I have such good news for you. <laughs> the good news is that there's a path out of alienation into union with the God who loves you. And, and right. that doesn't work for everybody, but it's certainly not like this condemning ultimatum. There's a highway out of hell. There's a highway out of hell and, and, and that it's a hell of today and that it's the hell of alienation and that people yeah. understand that word very well because yeah. they experience it and they're not in denial of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. Wow. Okay. Well, mind blown again. And again, I think our minds were blown on that three layers of that story. I think so much that I can't even, I have to listen to this again to digest it fully, but um, in all the right ways, you know, in some really beautiful ways. Um, yeah. Thank you, Brad. Could I close with two paragraphs from St. John Chrysostom's homily on the Pascha? Yeah, I was going to ask you, but... Yeah, so... Um, We're actually going to say that exact same thing as, <laughs> yeah. as it should happen. So. Yeah. so, quick backstory. In the late 4th century, St. John of Antioch preached a sermon on at the Paschal Feast, which is death and resurrection celebrated together in in his church in Antioch. And there was such an anointing on it that they named him... Chrysostom, silver tongue, um, and in a positive way, and that they said the Holy Spirit was speaking through this sermon so powerfully, we must preach it every year at Pascha until the Lord returns. So far, they have. I've got to preach it a few times on Pascha myself. It's just four paragraphs. I'm going to read two of them. Enjoy ye all the feast of faith. Receive ye all the riches of loving kindness. Let no one bewail their poverty, for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one weep for their iniquities, for pardon has shone forth from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the Savior's death has set us free. He that was held prisoner of it has annihilated it. By descending into hell, he made hell captive. He embittered it. That means I gave it a stomachache, causing it to throw up. That's what that literally means. He embittered it when it tasted of his flesh. And Isaiah foretelling this cried out, hell said he was embittered when it encountered you in the lower regions. It was embittered for it was abolished. It was embittered for it was mocked. It was embittered for it was slain. It was embittered for it was overthrown. It was embittered for it was fettered in chains. It took a body and met God face to face. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took that which was seen and fell upon the unseen. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? Christ is risen and you are overthrown. Christ is risen and the demons are fallen. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life reigns. Christ is risen and not one dead remains in the grave. For Christ being risen from the dead has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To him be glory and dominion unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Christ Boom. is risen. I The whole time you were talking, I had this scene from the Mandalorian in my mind. I don't know if there's any Mandalorian watchers, but like where Mando goes into the beast yes. and then comes out. The, like he has, uh, yeah, he's. And he's, the beast is dead, you know, it's beautiful. And that's Inside exactly out. how the early pre- church preached it. Yeah, that right straight goal. into hell, death, yep. sin, and just blow it from the inside out, right? Exactly. exactly. It's cooler too. I mean, it's such a cooler message. I don't understand why we're so resistant. It's like, it makes so much sense. And it's so much, I mean, it's just, 